Welcome to our mini lecture series about acid-base disturbances and their clinical implications. So, what are we going to talk about? First of all, why is it so important that your blood pH is nicely regulated? And large shifts are really prohibited, you could say. You have a normal blood pH at around uh, pH 7.4, so that's slightly basic. And we'll see how the body take care, uh, takes care of uh, disturbances that uh, um, seem to disbalance uh, the normal pH. Um, we'll talk about why that is very important and what kind of buffer systems the blood has to take care of that regulation. Thirdly, um, we'll see how the lungs and the kidneys are involved in regulation, uh, regulating blood pH. And after that uh, broad uh, background of uh, um, the biochemistry and uh, the metabolics, um, we are going to look at a few clinical examples. And we have two in the first lectures, uh, in the first lecture, and that's hyperventilation and COPD. And you'll see uh, how these kind of uh, clinical problems lead to disturbances in blood pH. Um, in the second lecture, we are going to have an example of a metabolically induced disturbance in blood pH. And we're going to talk about keto body induced acidosis, also called ketoacidosis. And this is, of course, in the context of diabetes mellitus type 1. And the last lecture will be about um, uh, um, uh, alkalosis induced by uh, the use of certain drugs. Uh, medication-induced alkalosis. So let's go and answer the most important question first. Why is it so important that the blood regulates its pH? And the limits, you could say, are nicely illustrated in this figure. And you see that the wiggle room of the body is not too large. Um, if you go above 7.8, you become too basic at, uh, in your blood levels. Uh, pH levels, and uh, if you go below pH 7.1, it's also a deadly situation. Why is this so important? That has to do with the fact that, for instance, enzymes uh, evolved to have pH optima. And they only work at certain pHs, because otherwise um, the disturbance of the amount of protons in their environment, they are of course dissolved in the blood, leads them to uh, function improperly. Either they don't function anymore or they start functioning when they shouldn't. And this is the main basic reason why the blood pH is so optimally regulated at around 7.4. If things go wrong, we either have a respiratory or metabolic alkalosis when the environment becomes too basic, and we have a respiratory or metabolic acidosis when the environment, the blood pH, becomes too low. You have too many protons. And you'll see what the difference between the respiratory or the metabolic source is from the rest of our um, video. So, what kind of uh, pH buffers does the blood have at its disposable to take care of controlling blood pH? Well, first of all, there's the phosphate buffer. Then secondly, there's the hemoglobin buffer. Hemoglobin can either uh, pick up a proton or release it. And actually, it functions as a proton transporter in uh, more ways than one. And thirdly, we have the most important one, and that's the carbonate bicarbonate buffer. And you have to remember that uh, all kinds of oxides, uh, whether nitrous, uh, nitrogen oxide or carbon dioxide, um, uh, these kind of uh, uh, compounds are acidic when you dissolve them in water. CO2 actually is a rather weak acidic molecule. So carbonic acid, H2CO3, is a rather weak acid. But it's still the one that's uh, able to contribute most to balancing your blood pH. And that has to do with the fact that the buffering powers of the phosphate buffer and the hemoglobin buffer are relatively limited. And secondly, that the um, CO2 carbonate buffer is the only one that can exchange with the environment optimally. And that means that you can uh, influence blood pH by the efficiency with which the lungs exhale CO2. So we're going to talk about that last one uh, mostly, and that's the way that uh, exhaling CO2 buffers the blood. 
But of course, the lungs aren't the only part that are uh, important in this, and I'll come back to that later. So how does CO2 transport protons from local environments in the body that are, you could say, disbalanced, for instance, because you produce a lot of uh, acids due to uh, catabolism because you want to generate ATP. Um, in this case, the protons are taken up by the blood. There is the conjugate ions and carbonic acid is formed, and that's shown over here. And that carbonic acid can then dissociate into CO2 and H2O, and the CO2 can be exhaled by the lungs. And in this way, you can influence and transport protons and take care of blood pH. So, you already see that the lungs are important here, and you can already see that uh, the production of uh, acidic molecules by metabolism is important. But we didn't discuss the kidneys yet. The kidneys can uh, get rid of protons uh, by secreting them into the urine. So this is also a major player in this whole system. And we'll get back to the role of the kidneys in lecture number three. We already discussed the lungs, the efficiency with which the lungs get rid of CO2. And finally, this has all to do with balancing the imbalance that comes from certain metabolic processes via the breakdown of food molecules. Okay, what is a good way to envisage what is actually going on? For that, we have the so-called Davenport diagram. And in the Davenport diagram, we look at the way the carbonate concentrations in the blood and the amount of CO2 that is exhaled, so that is uh, thrown out, you could say, into the environment, influence blood pH. And here you can see that at a normal rate of uh, um, CO2 exhalation, so that's uh, 40 uh, millimeter, um, milliliters of uh, mercury, um, you have a normal blood pH of about 7.4. Now let's suppose that we have a disturbance uh, by which we start to secrete or exhale too much CO2. We have a perfect example for that, and that's the clinical phenotype of hyperventilation. In hyperventilation, we get rid of too much CO2. That means that you lose an acidic molecule and you get so-called respiratory alkalosis. And that means that your blood pH shifts into the basic direction. Um, of course, this can lead to uh, certain clinical symptoms, and the symptoms in that case are confusion, dizziness, and you start throwing up. However, you don't need to be a very highly skilled doctor to take care of this kind of problems, because these problems can be pretty easily solved by getting rid of that um, amount of CO2 that's uh, given off to the environment in uh, a much too efficient way. And how do you interfere with that efficiency? By allowing the patient to breathe into a bag, local CO2 will go up, and the situation will stabilize and your blood will go into the direction of the normal pH. So that's an easy way to do this. You can also have a situation in which your CO2 um, exhalation by the lungs is not sufficient. So it's not too big, but it's too low. And this is, for instance, found in COPD. Here, lung function is impaired. That means that you can't get rid of CO2 quickly enough. And that means that you now have a respiratory acidosis because, again, remember, CO2 is a molecule that leads to acidity in the blood. And in that case, um, the um, um, clinical problems can't be solved as easily, alas, alas, as in the case of hyperventilation. So we talked about the relevance of pH regulation. It's all about optimal functioning of enzymes. We talked about the sorts of buffers that the blood has to take care of all these kind of problems. Um, and we showed that the CO2 uh, bicarbonate buffer is the most important one by far. And we gave you brief examples of uh, shifts in blood pH due to hyperventilation and COPD. Um, I hope that you are so interested that you will also check out the next two lectures. Thank you for your attention.